Right. Welcome and thank you for uh, joining us here as we have uh, come upon another week of our podcast for our loyal listeners. We apologize. We're, uh, we're about a day or so off. We had a little uh, scheduling conflict yesterday, but we're glad, however you're joining us, that you are joining us uh, and, you're, and you're here with us as we what we're trying to do here is, is just talk about uh, Christians at work uh, and some of the decisions that we've got to make, some of the things that we've got to work through, um, some of the situations we find ourselves in and how do we continue to have a influence to be salt and light uh, in a situation that, that maybe um, seems more difficult, at least on the surface. Uh, joining me as always is my esteemed colleague, Mr. Ray from Somerset. How's everything down there today? Everything is well, my friend. It's the election week addiction, uh, edition, uh, and all the precincts are reporting, and I'm glad to report God's still on the throne with 100% of precincts reporting. Uh, no turnover among any of the 24 elders around the throne. They have all been reelected, so uh, all is well. The rest of it don't matter. Uh, amen. Amen. Um, depending on when you're listening to this, we still don't have results from the other election, but... Uh, it's all good. It's all good. Uh, one way or another, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Um, we picked up for uh, those of you that were with us last time. Um, you know, we were kind of working through uh, these list of questions that our good friend Jodell Gerlach had sent us in. Um, and, you know, we'd gotten to a place where, uh, you know, we were talking about the differences between, you know, working for a private company, a small publicly held, a family or a small non publicly held and a family owned company um, versus what it's like to work for a publicly traded company and some of the trade offs that we have there. Um, and, you know, today throughout our conversation, we want to continue to take the rose tin off of Michael's glasses and uh, open him up to what the rest of, of us maybe face on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but before we get deep into that discussion, there's there's one, I, I want to finish up Joe's list because he was so kind to send it to us. Um, and the last question he had, uh, and I'll, I'll throw it at you first, Michael, is, you know, I think I, not only Christians at work, but uh, all of us, um, how, how do we find this work-life balance? Uh, and I think especially for, you know, Christians that are active and involved, you know, you, you get pulled in a lot of different directions and, you know, between work responsibilities, home responsibilities, church responsibilities, maybe civic involvements, kids' ball games. I mean, what's, what's the formula? How do you, how do you make it work? How do you make a balance? That's an excellent question. And, and uh, you know, I, would, I think you would agree that any, anyone who uh, is good at what they do ends up with this problem um, is that people that are good at what they do end up with more stuff to do. And so if, if you're, if you want, you know, you probably heard it said, if you want something done, you give it to a busy person. Um, Cause there's a reason that they they're, they're busy, right? They're, they've got, they're good at what they do and they get things done. And so people who are good at what they do end up with more on their plate than they can handle. So, you know, I, I think, you know, let's make I guess, first of all, make sure that we're defining what we what we think balance is. And as is true in most cases, what the world would define as work-life balance is probably not what you and I would define as work-life balance. So, you know, the, the world's the world's view of that, you know, is, you know, how, how do we make sure that we got enough me time? How do we make sure that we got enough leisure time? Um, and and I'm, I'm sure there's some some family time in there that, that we, we we probably wouldn't disagree with. In, in as you and I talk about it, I think we would talk about it differently. As we've said before, that, that we can't um, we, we can't compartmentalize our lives. Um, you know, how do I make sure I got enough time for work, enough time for God? The whole point of the podcast is God comes with us to work, right? right. And and so um, it, it's not it's not as if we were trying to divide up the pie chart um, to make sure that God is getting enough time and our family is getting enough time. It, it is. You know, we're taking God with us everywhere, and because we because we are uh, Christians at work and Christians at home and Christians in our marriage and Christians at, at church, um, how do we, as you said, balance those responsibilities? And uh, I, I'm uh, I don't like a lot of things. Don't know if there's a prescription for that. I'm glad we're struggling with it. Um, I know that's my pat answer to everything. Um, <laughs> But, but I, I do think that 
this this is not you know not not breaking news, but but, but Christians have to be willing to um, sacrifice some um, what the world would call important opportunities. I just think you have to sacrifice some important opportunities if you're going to keep the balance that God would want you to have um, in all in all areas of your life. It means it means maybe you can't. You can't be on that civic board or you can't be on that um, uh, whatever. You can't be part of that other civic organization that, that you do good stuff and that you believe in because you've got, you've got other responsibilities that are more important. And, and it's, you know, for the Christian, it's often not the bad things that crowd got out. It's the good things. And, you know, if, if we are, uh, I've heard it described and I like the description that, you know, if you look at your schedule, those those fifteen to thirty minute gaps in your schedule, um, that's where you're giving God time to work. And if if our daily planner is crammed down to ten minute increments, um, with with no with no available time for God to work in in us, uh, that I think that's clearly a problem. That, that busyness is. Uh, is a is a Christian fault keeps us from seeing opportunities. Yeah, I think you know I I'm, I'm glad we threw this one at you because I'm convinced that uh, you and I are probably 20 years too young to answer this question um, since we're right in the throes of it. You know, right? Um, it probably is a great question for somebody that's retired that can look back and give a little guidance. Um, you know, I, I, this is one of these things that you know I struggle with all the time um of how do you balance every responsibility that you have and not you know not feel like you're cheating somebody um but you i I think you're right that as long as you're struggling with it as long as you're looking as long as you're finding opportunities as long as you're striving to keep the balance um you know that's what's important the other thing is uh you got to understand too what a priority is right you know um and, and there's, you know, sometimes you need to turn down professional things because there's spiritual things that you've got going on. Um, you know, I, as, as many, you know, that listen to the podcast, you know, I, um, I'm a financial planner to support my preaching habit. Right. Um, and so, you know, my main goal is preaching. Um, and so there are, you know, weekend deals or things that I don't do just because of that, because I've got to have some time to do the things that I'm really wanting to do. Um, and, and that's, I, I, there's, there's always kind of that struggle with that is, could you do better professionally if you do some of these things? Yeah, probably. Um, but at what cost? There's always a cost. We've all, you know, it's, uh, the, you know, the joke goes, you, the only thing that I guess now Jeff Bezos and I have in common, uh, is we all work on the same 24 hour day. That's, that's it. Um, he's a lot wealthier and I'm sure better looking than I am, but we both work in that same 24 hour parameter. So, you know, how do you fill up those hours and get the return on those hours? So an ROH, if you will, um, that that's something that you really want. I mean, that, that's, that takes some prayer, that takes some thought, that takes some meditation, um, that takes some, you know, really uh, diligence to, uh, to make sure that you get the return that you want. Um, sometimes, you know, I, I think we don't consider that, you know, what's the return I'm getting out of this time. Um, you know, maybe I can work my way up to middle management and maybe I can get a, another dollar an hour. Um, but you know, at, at what cost have I sacrificed, you know, these years with my kids or if I sacrificed time with my wife, I mean, what well, have I sacrificed opportunities to work in the kingdom all, you know, for a couple of dollars an hour, I, th- those are things you got to weigh, yeah. um, and, and hard questions. I think you got to ask yourself. You know, the preacher in Ecclesiastes would say that that I think in if I'm if I'm handling that those section of verses correctly, um, if, if we have our priorities in line and our and our focus is where it needs to be, that there is time for everything in our lives. You know, there's time to time to be born, a time to die, time to plant, time to read. You know, that that familiar passage. I think part of that means that if if we have structured our lives appropriately in a, in a God-centered and a godly way, that there are time for the things that we need to do. Um, it may not always be the time <laughs> time for things we all want to do, but there are time for things we need to do. And, and I didn't follow through on my point very well about the difference between that that 
that uh, worldly mindset of work-life balance um, and what, what God would say. And, and I think from a Christian perspective, it's more about, as you, as you noted, um, what is our purpose and what's our priorities? And if our purpose and our priorities are aligned correctly, um, I've heard it described as a top button issue. If we, if we, on a men's dress shirt, if you get the top button right, if God is our top purpose and top priority, the rest of the buttons kind of fall in line. If you put the wrong button in that top button hole, the, re you, you, it's, the rest of the shirt's jacked up. You can't, you can't fix it. And so that, that top priority being in the right place kind of makes the rest of our lives fall, fall in line. Um, and, and I think everything will find its appropriate water level if, if we get the first question right. If we waffle on the first question, if God's not really on the throne of our hearts, um, if, if, if other things steal that from time to time, if, if the first question's not right, then everything, you know, the cogs start flying off the machine. Nothing, nothing lines up appropriately. Um, and, and another thing that I've tried to remind myself, and I'm not good at this, and my wife may have comments on this, <laughs> on this Facebook post, but there's just, there's just no glory in busyness. We, 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 I think we have this uh, mindset, or at least I have this mindset at times that if I have crammed as much as possible into my day, then I have proven myself to be productive, that there is a, that there is a glory in being as busy as possible. And the, the most godly people that I know, um, make a point to leave themselves to leave God's space that they that they're they are meditating and praying and studying in a closet somewhere for 30 minutes and not because it was scheduled right not not because they they squeezed it in there but that but they just leave God room for when that when that needs to happen um and and more spiritually minded because of it uh so no glory in busyness. There's a time for everything. Keep the first thing first. Yeah, we, we've got a saying in you know in sales that busyness does not always equal business. Um, and, and some guys think you know as as long as I'm busy, then then somehow that's going to lead to production. Um, and it just doesn't. You know, if you're doing the right things, yes. Um, and, and I think that that's where that's at, that if we're doing the right things, we can be very productive. But if, if we're just running, chasing our tail everywhere, um, and, and we don't have, you know, I'm, I'm going to work on that a little bit better. My ROH, my return on hours, um, or return on time, um, I, that, that's gotta be better. What, what are we trying to get out of this? What, what's our goal? What's our, what are we trying to accomplish? And then align the busyness to that, um. All right, so um, I think we thoroughly ducked that question this morning. <laughs> so uh, I, I, the, the, the other part of that I, I would ask, and, and the, I think we need to think about is, you know, is it okay in your judgment for Christians to have 70, 80 hour a week jobs? And, and that may be the core of the, the question is, you know, what, what, what percentage of our lives is appropriate if there is, if there is a balance? Uh, and I think that's an extremely hard question. Um, but what is, at what point can we no longer um, honestly say, no, no, God's on the throne of my heart and he's the first priority. Um, that that's, that's difficult. Yeah. I think that's a tough one, especially, you know, cause it all depends. Everybody's different too. Right. So it, it all depends on where you're at, you know, in, in life, you know, what family you have to balance, um, you know, what, what responsibilities you have to balance. It's because it, everybody's got different balls in the air, right? You know, there's the reason why, you know, you and I have more balls in the air right now is, is because we've proven we could handle small things. And so people started giving us bigger things. Right. And so, you know, 22 year old guy, he's got more time to work a 60 hour week, um, probably than 40 year old guy with three kids. Um, you know, so I, I think that's part of it. Um, but the other thing is, it's just, I, I mean, it's hard, um, it, you know, it's hard to figure out. Um, and that's why I think this question is very individual to people is, you know, uh, and you've got to ask yourself that question is, you know, is there balance here? I mean, am I doing what I need to do, you know, for my family with my family? I think sometimes, especially husbands and, you know, not just a misogynistic call here, uh, 
But I think more often husbands are inclined that when they're working, if they're providing for the family financially, then that's how they're leading the family. Um, and, and that's just a huge fallacy of thought. Um, if you're not teaching and guiding the family, I, just sending them a check. I, I mean, that's the same reason why, you know, I'm, um, I, I think institutionalism is wrong. You know, you can't just send a check. I mean, I, that's like, to me, that's like institutionalism for the family. Like, we're just going to send the family a check and y'all will see me every once in a while, but I'm not really involved in the day-to-day -day activities. I mean, I, I just, I don't think that works parenting wise. I don't think that works long-term for a marriage. Um, and, and I don't know how many marriages I've seen worked with over the years that essentially fell apart because of that. Husband was married to the career. He worked 60, 70 hours a week. Wife and kids never saw him. Wife ended up really married to the kids. Kids graduate from high school. And now they look at each other and they're strangers and everything falls apart. And so there, there's some danger there if you're not, you know, again, if you're, if you're not constantly asking yourself, you know, how am I making this balance? So I, I don't know. I wouldn't tell you that's a definitive no. Um, most, like most things here, Michael, I don't give definitive answers like that. Uh, what we would tell you though, is, uh, pray about it. Think about it. Ask yourself, you know, everything we do is at a cost. Um, and, and, and what's your cost for, for a 60 or 70 hour work week? And are you willing to pay it? My, my last thought on this is a, I've seen the example and it, it stuck with me. So, I mean, it must mean something is, you know, the, if you think about the, the, the expanse of our existence as a rope, like uh, that's the timeline of our life. It's a rope and it goes on in, into, in, into eternity, right? Because we're eternal beings. And so we just think about it. It's not a perfect example, but play along is that our, our existence, our timeline of our life is this rope that goes on to eternity. Our life on earth is like the last two inches of, of that, or the first two inches of that rope. And, and so we take that first two inches of our lives and say, if I just, if I just um, work my brains out for the first three quarters of an inch of this rope, then there's this tiny sliver of rope um, here, this, this tiny little millimeter of rope called retirement that I'm, I'm going to work my brains out so I can enjoy this millimeter, ignoring the miles of rope beyond. And so that, again, that it's just, you know, that's a common point, just another way to, to kind of visualize it. But when we, when we ignore that the vast majority of our existence as, as a being is, is beyond the part of that rope where we're on earth, that if we, if we are living our whole lives, if the, the focus of our existence is this millimeter of the rope of our lives, that is uh, retirement, that, that we can have enough money put away that I can enjoy my retirement. If that, if that is the goal of our existence, that we're going to plow away and, and put other responsibilities behind and ignore the, the miles of rope beyond this earth. Uh, man, that, I just, there's a lot of people making that trade. And, and in that perspective, that is just so absurd. Um, but if you don't, if you don't have the, the visual of that, uh, of how much of our rope is, is beyond this earth, uh, you lose that pretty quick. Yeah. And, and that's, that, that's again, back to, you know, the cost, you know, why, why am I beating my brains in for a millimeter when I've got miles behind? Yeah. Um, all right. So, um, sh shifting gears a little bit here, we're going to go back and, and seeing with our last, you know, I, by the way, I, I should have started off the show with this, uh, you know, we have a bonus show today for <laughs> our loyal listeners. Normally, both, uh, of you. Yeah, both of you, normally, you know, you get a great hour plus out of us. But today the show's on sale half price. Um, we've got a 30 minute stop um, here based on scheduling. So, you know, for our last, you know, 10, 15 minutes here, uh, what we wanted to kind of talk about is, you know, really this debate we got into last time. That as a as a small business, and 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 that's Michael's side of the equation, right? He he works for a small family-owned business. As a small business, you can do more things to control culture. You can do more things to impact culture. I think we we all can kind of see that, especially when you're the family of of the family business. And publicly traded companies, it's different. You got different goals. You're answering to shareholders as opposed to you know a family meeting. So that there's a lot of differences here. And so the debate that we 
kind of began last time was, you know, at, at what's the tipping point? Right, because the goal of a small business is to become a big business. Like it's just to grow. You know, I, I don't think there's ever any small business, um, at least none that I've been involved with. And uh, Michael, feel free to, to challenge this. That says, you know what, boys, we're going to stop growing this year. We've kind of got to where we wanted to be. You know, we're gonna we're gonna stop growing. We're gonna turn down customers. We're gonna turn down accounts. We're just gonna kind of maintain. Nobody does that, right? You're trying to add growth every single year. Um, but do you grow yourself out of the culture and whether that growth comes, you know, organically or um, whether it comes through acquisitions, you know, is there a tipping point and how do you continue to, you know, to, to grow and to change that culture? Um, and, 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 you know, so how do you, how do you control that through growth? Um, you know, obviously, you know, Michael's from a small business standpoint, you want to keep it. What, how, how do you keep that? that culture through growth? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, obviously one that I think small businesses that are trying to grow wrestle with, and you, you hope that you've got um, a, a culture that is distinct enough and ingrained enough that it, that it'll, it'll survive new leadership. Um, because, you know, that that's ultimately the issue, I think, right, is that you know, regardless of how good your culture is, the, 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 the problem is small businesses don't survive forever. <laughs> that, 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 that those cultures, they, they either grow into something else or they're acquired or, you know, family businesses only last a couple of generations on average, you know, good ones only last a couple of generations on average. Whereas publicly traded companies are by design perpetual. That there's, there's new ownership all the time. And there's new leaders all the time. And so whatever, whatever culture was there in a, in a enormous enterprise, it gets diluted or changed over time just by, just by nature of what businesses are, you know, the, as, as strong as the Apple culture was, you know, under Steve Jobs, it has changed. It's changed because the leaders, the leadership has changed. The ownership has changed as, as much as they want to hold on to that culture. And it was incredible that they had the culture they had kind of driven by his personality in a huge, in a huge organization. But because there's new personalities in there, it's hard to keep the same culture. And so, especially small businesses, it's, it's, it's really hard to, to maintain that, that same, that same culture. So, you know, how do you do it? You, you try to have, you try to make sure that the values of the culture are explicit that they're not, that they're not uh, just implicit, that they're not just assumed, but they're, I think you make a point that they're explicit. These are the things that we believe in. Um, but, but, you know, even yet, is that, is that going to be true on the, in the next leadership team? Are they, are they going to show that in the same way? And so uh, the, the, the times of change tend to, I think, soften whatever culture you've got they just they tend to smooth out the 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 edges that make you distinct and and as you grow and as leadership changes and more people have their input corp you turn into you turn into bland publicly traded you know vanilla because because the 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 edges the distinctiveness have just been eroded away because of time and change and more people's input into the into the conversation so that, that'd be my first thing. I'll, I'll let you got one more thing that I'll let you respond. As, as I went back and, and listened <laughs> to, to me squawking on the last podcast, I, I would, I, I would, I would note that make sure that we're very clear that there's, there's a ton of um, immoral small business. So this is not a deification of small business that, and, and there's also really good people in um, corporate America. Um, I think the statistics would say that half the world works in, in large businesses or half of America works in large businesses. So no question, there's really good people. And, and Paul would say, even in incarceration, in the last few verses in the book of Philippians, that in, in the Roman, you know, talk about a, talk about a uh, interesting organization in the Roman government, he could have an influence with those in Caesar's household. So somebody that is extraordinarily salty can have an impact where they are, regardless of 
of the culture that they're steeped in. Okay, okay I'm done. Right, and, and, and so really that was kind of the, the debate, right? Is, you know, is small business world, you know, Pollyanna utopia? And, and, and I think to a certain degree it can be. The struggle I'm convinced we have in, in publicly traded America is that when you're a publicly traded company, you're owned by the public, you're owned by shareholders. Anybody can buy shares of, of your organization. And so therefore the morality level becomes whatever society's moral compass is, right? So, you know, whereas as a Christian, you may take very conservative views on, um, on issues, um, whether it be for everything from social drinking to, um, you know, uh, corporate involvement with different groups. I mean, there, there's a, a lot of things that maybe personally um, you would have some qualms with that, that as a corporation, you know, you can't follow a, you know, a, a strict segment of your customer base and say, that's what we're going to have that guide of, of morality. in. we've got to be broad to the masses because um, our ownership group is diverse. Our board is, is diverse and our customer base is diverse. So if we take too hard of a line, um, what happens is your ownership can change like that. Um, in a small business and a family owned company, those shares aren't for sale. <laughs> Nobody can come in and do a hostile takeover of the company that Michael works for. Um, they can't come in and just start buying up shares and become activist investors. Um, and at a publicly traded company, you can, you know, they can, your shares are available on the open market and people can go out and grab them up. And all of a sudden you got two new board members and boys, we're going to do stuff different around here. Um, uh, so there's there's that, that that I think is a wrestle with. But the big thing, and, and you know, again, I went back and listened to, and, and I'm a cynic. Um, everybody that knows me knows that's just that's what you get when you when you uh, get me at the party. But there are good people, and there are good organizations, and in, in corporate America, um, the main thing I really want to get across is where we put those lines, right? And and, and where a conservative Christian would draw their lines of this is what I think is the moral world we live in society would expand those lines uh, you know what Procter and Gamble thought was a you know ideal family value in 1950 looks very different today um, and, and they're gonna you know market to a very different dynamic today they're gonna be involved in giving to very different dynamics today so you know corporate America is going to change and their moral compass is going to be the moral compass of the people. Um, whereas, you know, I, I think we've got to just realize that, you know, because, you know, you can have the human experience isn't, isn't black and white, right? It's, you know, there are good people that do bad things. There are bad people that do good things. There are good people at, you know, bad corporations that have bad, you know, corporate malfeasance, but they're really good and they're influencing at the bottom. And there's, crummy people at places where the leadership is is, is all aces so uh, you know uh, it, it, it's hard to brand any one of those and if we did that last time you know I, I definitely apologize for that I don't mean to brand anybody as a good or a bad just that there's more dynamics in play here yeah I think what you note there is is that when and there's probably a whole other you know whole other conversation of if you do have a small business with a really strong culture should you go public that that's you know from a morality standpoint, if if we are saying that there's an inevitability of the watering down of the culture and, and the godliness of it, is should you is is that is that just a greed thing? Um, so the, that's probably a really interesting conversation. I'd like to have with somebody smarter than you. But the uh, uh, the bigger question or point that you bring up is because the funnel is so big, in when you become publicly traded as far as who my shareholders are, who my employees are, you're just, you're pulling from, as you said, it, it becomes a, um, just a, a pool of society at large, right? You, you end up with, again, the funnel is so big that you, you just end up with this sample of what, of what the, the U.S. is, or maybe even the world is, depending on how big your corporation is, that our real issue is, if, if, if and I would say this the same thing about politics, <laughs> Is, is again, those politicians just coming out of the world. They're just funneled out of the world. They're a sampling of what the world believes. If we really have an issue with that, um, if we really have an issue with corporate America becoming more immoral or politicians becoming immoral, it's because the society that they're funneled out of is immoral. 
we better change the society. And so to think that we are going to circumvent the system <laughs> and go change a corporate uh, culture without changing the people in the culture, we're, it's, it's not realistic. It's got, that Jesus would say, it's got to change with the hearts of the people. And it's got to be a bottom up change. To, to think that we're going to change a law about uh, some immoral practice that we disagree with and just get people to comply with it. And it's, that's the way it's going to be that that's trying to circumvent the system. We're, we're trying to change the actions and not the hearts of the people. If you want a different abortion law, you better change some hearts about abortion. Uh, and I don't mean to get down. That's a whole other, but, but just to, to, to say, to make the point that if we're losing the cultural war, we're going to continue to lose the, the, the different fronts that we're talking about. We're going to continue to have less moral leaders and less moral businesses and less moral um, civic organizations if they're all pulling from a pool that's less moral. And so as, as long as we keep losing market share as Christians in the world, then we should expect the institutions that come out of the world to to have those uh, to have those flaws. Yeah, I dare you insinuate that prohibition didn't work. <laughs> That's the example, right? You try to circum try to circumvent the system, um, and and think that somehow that the that the law is going to make people more moral. Um, we we better go about making the argument for why morality is and and, and Christianity is important. When you do that, um, anyway, I'm off I'm, I'm off that soapbox. But what what do we expect? When when there's there's less when there's less salt in the world, the institutions become less salty. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And we're, and we're at a, at a at a stopping point here, so we could keep debating this, and maybe that's what we do next time. Is we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what um, bottom up growth looks like, as opposed to top down. I, I think that's that's a good kind of debate and argument to to work through. Is you know, if we want to influence and change our culture, our society, our community, what is that bottom up? change look like because that's that's the biblical method right I, I mean i think we can make pretty good arguments out of the new testament that they were bottom-up approaches i don't recall um the passage where they said hey if we could just convert the king then everything would change um i think they went about converting the masses first um, so let's talk about that next time along with any of your questions as you all uh write or call in or text us we're happy to, to field those thanks again to jodell gerlach um, for his uh, teeing us up on, on these, this line of questioning and, and helping us uh, get through this. Um, again, thank you all. We will uh, check in next week with uh, more banner and probably duck a few more questions. Yeah, I might have filibustered you a little bit uh, this morning, so my apologies for that. I'll, 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 I'll listen. I'll take all listener feedback very seriously in that regard, uh, but I'll, I'll look forward to the next one, my friend. All right. See you, brother. See you.